Hello, and welcome to the program. I'm Dr. Philip Miles. The name of the program is Total Healing. Before we get into the word, let's just lift this up to the Lord today, his message for you and for me as well. Father, we come before you. We ask that this would minister to your people individually and collectively. We ask that you would give them insight through the Holy Spirit revealing Jesus in every scripture and in every word that I would say pursuant to your holy call. I thank you, Lord, that people will be healed today. I thank you that people will be set free today. And I thank you that you will cause them to use these principles to be set free and to fulfill what was said in Isaiah 61, that the captives would be set free and the blinded eyes would see and the poor would become rich, be rich in you. And thank you for this year of Jubilee, which is a year of restoration. We pray all of these things in the precious, matchless, majestic name of our Lord and Savior. His name is Yeshua, the Messiah, Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you for tuning in today. Today we're talking about what holds your way with God for a total healing. How do you go to get to the way? First of all, you must be in the spirit. You must transcend in your prayer and in your receiving of healing from the flesh to being in the spirit. It is important that you be in the spirit. And one of the great bridges of being in the spirit is to wait on God. While you're waiting, you're doing something. You're losing your flesh, and you're trusting in your faith that you trust in him. For in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him. Now, your healing is based on the perfect high priest. In the Old Testament, the priest would go in, the high priest would go in once a year into the Holy of Holies. But this was a very holy place. And so he might, if he was not right or he was not pure, he could die in there. So they would tie a rope to his leg. And if he didn't come out after a certain amount of time of sprinkling the blood, they would drag him out. And they would know then for that whole year, it would not be good, famine, curses, anything, because it went as the high priest went. Well, when Jesus came, we have a new high priest. The, the Bible says he is a priest forever, not just one year, but a priest forever. When you have a priest for eternity that is righteous, that is a sacrificial lamb with no blemish and no sin in him, you really have eternal life. I want to read to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. It says, But we all, when open face, beholding in the glass the glory of the Lord, and we are transformed and changed into the same image from glory to glory, even by the spirit of the Lord, not by night, might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Well, how are you transformed and how are you changed? This would take you directly to the book of James chapter one, which says that when you look in a mirror, and you see your face in a mirror. If we say the image, the word of God is this mirror, and you look in and you see Jesus, as you look at him, the Bible says, you are transformed into that same image. That same image gives you that same power. 
as Paul says, the same power lives in you that raised Jesus from the dead. Now, Peter, when he walked on water, the Bible says, and this word we'll use a lot today, that he beheld him. As he was beholding Jesus, he could do what Jesus did. Jesus was walking on water. So he was. When he took his eyes off of Jesus, he began to sink. We know also in the book of Numbers, they said uh, that God told uh, Moses to fashion a brass snake upon a hem. I mean, upon a pole. And he says, as they looked at the pole, as they beheld the pole, they were healed. And in John 3, when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, he brought that up. He said to Nicodemus, as Moses lifted up the snake on a pole, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. He's telling us to behold him so you can be transformed into your healing. You're transformed in it. Because is he sick where he is? No. We know that from 1 John 4 and 17. And I will read that. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. We know that we have the righteousness of Christ. The eyes of God see us as being righteous for what he did on the cross. That was a great exchange. My sin put on him, your sin put on him, and every sin in the past and those in the future were put on him. And then his righteousness came to us. That was a clothing of righteousness. Paul says we have this righteousness now. We have this mind of Christ now. So here and we are made perfect for boldness for that day of judgment. But it says here, because, that's an important word here, transition, as he is, that is Jesus, so are we where? Not in heaven, in this world. Is he sick in heaven? No. Is he poor in heaven? No. Does he have bad relationships in heaven? No. He's the head. The body, the, the body of Christ is connected to the head. They are one. If the head is well, the body must be well. The head is well. The body must be well. It says, for in him, in Colossians, dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. It also says that he is the visible image of the invisible God. That's what he was trying to tell Philip, <laughs> the guy I was named after, or the disciple. He says, if you've seen the Father, you've seen me. And as you behold him, you become like him. You behold his glory and you are transformed into the same image. Let that seek in. His image does not have cancer. There's no divorce. There's no uh, crime. There's nothing like that in his image. No plague. Nothing that is there. We have Psalm 71 to thank for protection. As we say that he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High will find shelter under the wings of the Almighty. Now we have two names for God in that first verse. The Most High God that is above all other gods. And El Shaddai the Almighty. But a word what we miss is this. He that dwelleth, not he that visits the secret place of the Most High. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High. That's your address. Where you dwell 
is your address, not where you visit. Just like we say we're going home, Paul says we are now then ambassadors for Christ. An ambassador does not live in the country where he is doing the work and representing his home. We go home to our real home. We don't eat the same kind of food at home as we eat in a foreign land. We don't have the same kind of language. You won't hear any profanity in your home. It's a different thing when we go home. And that's his only job left when he said it is finished. The work of the cross is he's coming back for redemption. Redemption. To redeem our bodies back to himself. Not to us to see relatives and gold streets and all the other good things and worship but mainly to be with Jesus. That is so precious, to be with Jesus. So when your body is injured and you behold him, looking at him on the cross, as it says in John 3, you, may, you are made complete and you're transformed. So you say, now, Lord, I identify myself with you the same image the same image Genesis 1 created in his image and in his likeness the same image glory to God now in Isaiah 53 we all know that in verse 5 it says that and with his stripes we are healed when you look at the real Hebrew for stripes, it actually means we are joined and bound together. You're joined and bound together with that suffering. Peter speaks of that in his writings, participating in his sufferings. The Christians in the biblical days did that. I shouldn't say the biblical days, but I did say that. And we should enjoy and look for the joy of it that we are suffering for his sake because you will never walk into your full anointing until you have suffered for Christ your full and true anointing and calling you can't walk into it until you have suffered for Christ blessed are those when men do revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. For here is the kingdom of heaven. That's Jesus' word from the Beatitudes on the Sermon on the Mount. When he say that he was bruised, we think of bruised as being blue blood. But bru bruised in the Hebrew means crushed, smashed. That was for us. Crushed, smashed. That for us. This week I took a whole day off just from doing things and going to work. And I just sat there and thanked God. And I wanted to cry all day and weep of how good God is. I know we say a lot, God is good, and God is good all the time, God is good. But when you really think about it, if you say, God is good, and then just be silent for a moment, you can go through your entire life and still have more to be thankful for of how good he is. That is why Paul says his goodness leads to repentance. We kind of have it backwards here. We want everybody to be right first and then we'll accept them. But the woman caught in adultery, Jesus says, where are your accusers? He says, well, neither do I. And then he said, go and sin no more. We would say, go and sin no more, then we will accept you. But the love of Christ on you, him being grace, constrains you from doing things that are wrong, from going against those things which were in the law. Because in Romans, Paul calls the law the ministry of death. 
the ministry of death. He says it was written in stone. So he's not talking about the other five or six hundred uh, ordinances. He's just talking about the law. We know that when the law came, because they said they could keep it, they couldn't. 3,000 people were killed when he came down off of the mountain. On the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit was given to us, 3,000 people were saved. That was eternal life. Can you see why Paul wrote, the letter of the law killeth, but the Spirit gives life and gives it abundantly. Sometimes we have to think about what that means when he says abundantly. There are over five times in the New Testament where it says this, God is able. There's, and five is a number for grace. But it also says uh, an, another time that thou to him who is able. So that's seven times in the New Testament that it talks about God's ability. We should never question God's ability. Ephesians 3.20 says, for he is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask or think comma, according to the power that worketh in us. Sometimes people put an and in between each one. They say, well, he's able to do exceedingly and abundantly and more than we can ask or think or imagine. That puts a cap on each one. We can't put a cap on God. He is unlimited. When we say unlimited, we're talking about what it says in Psalms. It says he is altogether lovely. He's wonderful counselor, he's healer, he's savior, he's redeemer, he's the prince of peace, he's your provider, he gives you your wisdom. That's all together lovely. He's all together lovely. You may people that may know people that maybe one thing about them is lovely or maybe even four or five, but are they all together lovely? Jesus is all together lovely. In Psalm 50, verse 15, it says, Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. That's what he's saying. <laughs> he's able to deliver you. He is able, and he will answer you, knowing that from Jeremiah 33, 3, call on me, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things that thou knowest not. That happens so much when we need wisdom. And there are many of you out there who may have a mountain that you're trying to overcome. What is your mountain? When we go to Zechariah, and we go to verse 7, it says, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. That's actually verse 6. It's by his spirit. We cannot work it to make it work. It's by his spirit. But what I want you to see about your mountains is what the prophet Zechariah said to the ruler Zerubbabel. He was facing a mountain. They could not finish the temple. They could not finish the temple. And he came to him and he said this. The word of the Lord. He says, who art thou, O great mountain? What is your mountain? Is it you need a job? Is it a disease? Is it a divorce? Uh, a bad business deal? What is your mountain? And he says to it, before Zerubbabel thou shalt become a plain. God will make your mountain flat. He says that in Isaiah too. I will make the hilly places flat and the crooked places straight. And he shall bring forth the headstone. That is, he's going to kill your mountain. That's the death. <coughs> Pardon me. He will kill it thereof with shoutings of crying 
grace, grace unto it. Just say with me, grace, grace. Grace, grace, and then name your mountain. Say again, grace, grace, and name your mountain. It is so powerful that we're even saved by grace. If we, we, we look at Ephesians, it says we're saved by grace through faith. A lot of times we say it backwards, we're saved by faith through grace. But if we're saved by grace, grace is the building, faith is the door that we go through.